have a seat. If you want to talk, go outside. All right, folks, we're going to go for at least uh, 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll break for lunch. But we do want to get started because we have a lot of things on the agenda this afternoon. So we want to uh, continue pressing here until we get too hungry to work anymore. So uh, the next item on the agenda is our consultant's report. Do we have some minutes to approve? We'll take care of getting the minutes approved tomorrow. But So right now we're just going to recognize uh, Mr. Steve and John. You're recognized to identify yourself and your uh, Richard and your other folks there and present your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm with, this is John Stephen for the record from the Stephen Group, and I'm with Stephen Palmer on my right and Richard Kellogg on my left. And we're going to, we're going to start off with a presentation and update at this month's meeting. Okay, and, and this, this slideshow, I think folks you do have on your desk there if you want to follow along. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, we, we're going to look today, our agenda today for the update will be to update you on some of the private option claims data we've been analyzing, um, and then talk about some of the financial forecasts and maybe um, add to some of the discussion the governor had on the forecasting. Um, we're going to then talk about high cost population data, and we're going to, you're, you've asked uh, individuals to come in after us that will also help you with some of the data as you begin to hear their, their testimony. Um, we're going to talk about a spending comparison again. We've been trying to compare the spending here to other states um, since the beginning, and we have a few more slides on that we want to show you and um, hopefully educate you with regard to what's going on in other states. Um, the final thing is the update on state waivers. thought it was really important that we, we'd start to lay the groundwork and discuss what specific provisions other states have actually used and been accepted at CMS, and also some of the current proposals that are out there. So they may not be necessarily accepted, and we'll be able to explain for you which ones actually have and have not, okay? So we're gonna start, Mr. Chair, with the update on claims data analysis. So, so far, uh, our group is in the middle of analyzing 140 million lines of claims. Um, I wanna first thank the Bureau of Legislative Research for helping put together the data warehouse for us, and also the departments and the private carriers. Again, this has been a very, um, very collaborative approach to get all this data into this data warehouse to analyze for you. There are some issues we're seeing in the data that we can probably identify in our final report that may help you going further, because when you start analyzing some of this data and you've got carriers that are reporting the data in different designations for different claims, it's somewhat difficult and we have to do a lot of legwork to identify what cl which claims mean what from carriers. And so we'll offer some, some ideas. Um, we want you to better understand the population. That's the key issue here. So when you make your policy decisions, you'll feel comfortable knowing what the experience has been to date. Um, what type of claims in the carrier experience and also the level of claim experience compared to traditional Medicaid. I think you, meant, you heard from the governor talking about traditional Medicaid versus private option experience. I think it's going to be really important for all of you to try to see what the, what, the, what the similarities are within a similar type population. But I caution you, it has been very difficult for our, our team to find the right comparisons because the populations are so different. So that's very difficult to do, um, but we're going to try the best we can and we're looking at a um, couple populations and we'll be able to provide you with more information on that. So let, we'll start with the fact that the private option carriers are receiving cost share payments as well as premium payments. So I wanted, I wanted to make sure we were able to identify for you the amount of premium. So they're getting a premium payment. They're also getting from the department a cost share payment that's covering the cost sharing for that experience. So that's why some of, the some of the PMPMs are going to be different among the different carriers. So 
really looking at that, you can get to see how it's really ramped up here from January all the way to March. We have data all the way to March, but what we're going to show you today is really that first year of claim experience, that calendar year 2014. Um, and again, knowing that things are still working its way out and we don't have access to that current data, but you also are going to see some really good, um, I think, messages, stories, um, and also what is that data telling you? And you may all have individual, your own individual conclusions. This is really about what the data is showing us, and we want to be able to share with you that data. So the payments um, on the PMPM costs add up to $484. Um, you will see that there are different carrier two. We not, we're not mentioning the carrier by name, but you'll see the carriers and the carrier has different total payment, um, PM, PM. That's because the cost sharing difference here. But at the end of the day, that PM, PM is $487, uh, $484, based upon the premiums that were paid and the member months that we saw in the data that we were given for that calendar year. So you should realize that that, th that number that the department is mentioning around 480 seven, sometimes 489, it's gonna change, but 484 was for that calendar year based on all the claims that we analyzed. We reviewed the estimate of the, from the carriers. We reviewed the cost. Now this is very important, this slide for each of you. This is the actual cost. So on one end, the department is paying a PMPM based upon what they were actuarially told and reviewed. And then on the other end, you have the actual claims experience. I think you're probably the only legislature in the entire United States that has this data, by the way. But you did that in statute that I thought was very, very um, good on your part to be able to get the data so you can make these types of policy decisions. Mr. These Steve, carriers. John, can I just ask a question here on these, this slide and the one that you just passed? Yes. Something I don't quite understand here. Here you're showing carrier number two has a per member per month based on claims of $339. Correct. And then carrier two on the top shows a uh, $581 based on premium. Correct. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is why do they have lower claims but higher premiums? Because the premium went from the actuarial assumptions and the experience is different. And then the cost share is different. So when you actually get the end of experience, at the end of the year, there's going to be this, what they call that medi medical loss ratio, which we explain in our report. So some carriers, Mr. Chairman, are going to have to pay back. Some will go back and ask for additional dollar, or some will lose, if, depending upon how the contract is written. In this state, your carriers, together, collectively, the experience was lower than what the department expected in the waiver in the PMPM, which is a good thing meaning that they will be paying back to the state a substantial amount of dollars once the medical loss ratio is all figured out on their end. Now, you may see different numbers that they eventually have because there's still some claims that they settle at the end. There may be some changes. Bottom line here is, I don't think, and we went back to the carriers, you, I don't think you're going to see that much of a difference. So, yes, carrier two, for example, Mr. Chair, is going to be, per, on a percentage basis, paying back a lot more to the state. But they, they keep a certain percentage, as we explained in our report, and then they can only keep a certain amount for admin. After that, in profit, the rest has to be paid back to the state. Okay. In this case, the I federal Senator, government. Senator Chesterfield has a question on this, I think. Senator Chesterfield, you recognize? Yes, thank you. It's just very brief. Are you consistent with the carriers throughout the... Um, on the numbering? Mm -hmm. I knew you were going to ask that. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So We're you, trying to make so sure that... So carrier one under... Um, the payments add up a per member per month cost is different than the carrier breakdown on the uh, reviewed claims. I'm not sure on this slide, but I know throughout the slides were different, and I I wasn't even shared the name. So. Okay, this is to keep them confidential. Yes. With you guys. Huh? Yes. I see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The we got another one. Rep Representative Hammer, you got a question? Yes, sir. Just one. I was curious if you can help remind me of how is it that the audit, that the carriers are audited as far as the numbers that they're sharing with you so that we could look at, you know, what, what they're billing and what their actual costs are. 
How do we how do we get a comfort level about knowing that kind of information? I'm not sure the answer to how they're exactly audited by the insurance department. Um, Stephen, do you know? You were meeting with them. I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. I could find out. So the numbers that they give you, how do you substantiate that the the cost that they actually had to pay versus you know what they reimburse the provider for? How do you get into that information to see how that plays into the, Again, the bottom line number? That would be the insurance department, and so okay. I think that's probably a best question for them. All right, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, the largest source of payment that came from the claims was inpatient hospital. This next chart is really important um, because for a couple things. The $148 million, 25% 20, of the claims, inpatient hospital. 20% were office setting. Now, again, this goes back to my point early on that all carriers are not reporting into the data, the data that they get with the claims, not reporting on the same names. So it's very complicated. So an uh, office could be a primary care visit. An office could be going to see um, a, another a referral, a specialty care, something outside of the hospital-based setting. But they're, but they're different designations among the carriers. We lumped them together because that's the best we could do. And I'll show you after this some what better percentage to drill down on what that office really is. But understand that that, by and large, a lot of that is primary care, but some of it isn't. And one of the questions you want to ask at some point is, well, how many are actually, for their first visit, going to a primary care? And I think that's a really important question. The other issue is, if you look at emergency room, 10% of the claims, percent of carrier costs, or claims came from emergency room admission. So that's something that I think is important to this committee. It has been as the past two meetings we've been talking. So this just gives you an idea of the percentages of their carrier claims. Then we start to drill down a little. And this, isn't, this is a little different than the status report because I, I, I wanted to make sure I was, I was more clear for you on office. So here, and it may be hard to see the actual bar, I'm not sure if you can see, well I think it's okay on the video, but just looks a lot smaller here. But the outpatient represents on carrier one, and Senator again, this could be a different carrier, so they're all different. 39% of the hospital outpatient in this, 39% uh, of the claims were outpatient for this carrier. This carrier had 28% hospital inpatient, but then you begin to look at their office was a little higher, and you get to see where all these claims came from. If you have any questions, I can stop, but I want you to see this, because we're gonna go through three carriers, and you'll see the differences. The next one, 48.8% were hospital-based claims. Family practice, 7%, clinic, 3.7. And you can start to see why we, as the Stephen Group, we're starting to have difficulty with, these, with the data because it's, the designation is so different among carriers. And we've got to put all this together. So in the future, you want the carriers to report their claims with the same designation of that claim whether it's setting, office, what the office is, whether it's inpatient, where the facility is, to try to get more specificity so when you analyze it, you'll be able to identify much easier than we had. This is the third carry, and you can see even different miscellaneous. The other carries didn't have a designation of miscellaneous under their claims. Ambulance, DME, so I, I think this is, it's, th so I don't is, think this is in your PowerPoint. It's only on the screen. What does that 6% miscellaneous work out to in dollars? I, I know that. For that, I would have to go back, Mr. Chair, and see which carrier that was for. And um, I don't know that answer right now. I could find that out. Is this uh, standard uh, as far as practice that you've seen in other places where you just, uh, the carriers are allowed to categorize it different or however they want? I don't know the answer. That's more on insurance department question. Okay. Again, this is the data leading to a lot of conclusions you'll make too, so we'll want to find that out, and I'll, I'll look into that myself. And then we have the names of the carriers. So the largest payees of claims are the large hospitals. Um, and I don't think that would be a surprise to you, but some of you may 
want to look at at the, down the road, we meant, I think it was Senator uh, Sanders mentioned something about some hospitals do triage, some are better triage than others. There may be a best practice you want to look at, but this will give you an idea of where a lot of those claims payments are being made as far as the hospital settings. Okay, we've got a question. Senator Irvin, you recognize? Yeah, quick question just on is there any way to detect on this information on hospital as far as uh, first time hospitalization or re hospitalizations or if they're going straight to the hospital and bypassing a primary care physician, is there any way to? We're, we're drilling that out? down on that right okay. now. That's going to take some time, but I've asked the team to, to get that information if they can. I can show you a slide we're going to get to okay. that actually shows uh, the amount of time someone went to the ED emergency department once in a month or, or more than once okay. in one month. So again, this is all still preliminary. We're still working through a lot of this data, so. And one last, one more question just on the medical loss ratio on that. With that data, because um, that was one of the things I, was, I wanted to make sure was in, in the original bill, but um, was, would that data then perhaps potentially affect the PMPM premium actuarial as far as what they would set that as? what they would set their premium as, but that data. For the experience going forward, absolutely. Yeah, for the experience going forward absolutely. to reduce what then they would have to pay back to the state so you could see a lower premium per month, correct, based uh, on. On experience. On experience of what's been paid out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rep. St. Pamer, you've got a question you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Help me understand the coding that has to be entered in in order for somebody to be paid based on the particular code, which I know there's always a constant ongoing expansion of the code numbers. Did, were you able to ascertain any information by looking at those that would have brought a fair comparison between the providers based on the, how they were billed by code, or can you help me understand yeah, that? Yes, and Dr. Oliver is not here. He did a lot of that. Um, I, I, I've asked him that question, and he's indicated to me that he was able to identify, and it was took a lot of time, but just by you know, what the actual code designation said, whether it could be obstetrician, could be, you know, gastroenterology, whatever it was from his experience, he was able to combine those claims among carriers. So, so are we going to get that information or is that like three encyclopedias we, worth of information? Well, <laughs> it's, it's a data, it's, it, it could be very lengthy, but he is going to try to explain it in the final report okay. because we want to give you a recommendation going forward on how to categorize or help the carriers categorize in the future. To bring them all in line, so yes. the information. So it is going to be a code-based decision instead of just arbitrarily saying miscellaneous or office and some of the things we've got yes. here then. We're hoping. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, the largest diagnosis are acute physical conditions. Um, again, this is, this is coming right from the claim. So Representative Hammer, you can see, you know, the ICD number. You can see the actual name of the claim. I mean, there are literally, you know, thousands of, of claims out there that we're looking through. But this will give you the most, uh, the largest diagnosis. Two carriers dominate the market in their territories. We thought it would be important for you to at least see. Um, and market share was not a confidential issue. We, we've talked, the carriers, you know, admit everybody knows where Blue Cross is, where the others are located, but this might give you an idea of market share going forward and where one carrier has actually um, been able to get a lot more market share in an area. And it could be that they offer something different that one of the other carriers doesn't offer. You may hear about that in the future, maybe towards a benefit plan. Um, one may offer visual and dental, another doesn't, but this will change, obviously, over the future. There are a few heavy concentrations of private option members throughout the state. Um, I thought that the, you would be interested to know within your own counties how many are actually, um, you know, the, the actual population base. So we'll have some more stuff in the final report that really drills down county by county. Um, but this really gives, is going to give you a good idea of where the population comes from. I was actually... Um, surprised in a couple of the counties that I saw the high concentration of, of, of people on the private option 
if you take the total population of one county and you look at the number that are on the private option, it's a very high number. And there's, there's a few counties where they're real high numbers. And I'm still trying to drill down to make sure we get it, that accurate data. But example, in one county, it was close to like 30 to 40% of the population. So that could be that that county is, is an area where, again, it's low number population, rural, um, and maybe there are counties where there's not a lot of access. So this will be important information for you in the long run. And again, if you have copies and you have any questions after the hearing, I'll be happy to address them. So I want to I want to talk about emergency department, and I think that a number of you have really focused on emergency use for non-emergent purposes. And I know a number of the hospitals here are really doing the best they can to try to address that issue, as is the department. Um, but can you do better, as the governor says? Can we do better? Absolutely. Um, so, but let's look at what the data tells us on what we call these are frequent flyers. And that's just a term nationally that's used. Um, I think it's important, and, and, and Senator uh, Irwin, this might help you get at some of your question. So if we look at this, this slide, um, and I want to make sure, it, yes, it's up there. So the frequency of carrier ED visits by beneficiary and these are carrier claims, because I'm going to show you the next slide is going to be Medicaid claims. Okay? So this is the carrier. So 80,000 individuals, their first visit, um, or the ED visit in one month, the frequency was 80,000 visited an ED in, in, one, in one month period of time. When we start to look at how did that individual also go to the ED within that same month another time? You can see 31,847 of those were able to, to be in the ER or frequently visit the ER in that second, that second time, that second month. The third month, fourth month, you can see it starts to dwindle down. So this is, again, an area where we're going to really focus on in the final report. This is all preliminary, but the data is there to be able to show you the number of times that these individuals are using the emergency room. So I think it's going to be very beneficial for you to be able to see, is there a pattern here? And can we, remember we talk about care coordination, is there a way we can identify this and find out if there's an intervention strategy? And I know that a lot of the folks in the medical society want to come up with strategies here. And you might be able to do things in the contract that require that type of strategy. So then we look John, at the med John, just hold on one second. Representative Murdoch, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, John, uh, appreciate you. Go, can, can we go back for a second? I'm, I'm catching up to you on a question on uh, the, the claims. Are these paid claims or uh, total claims submitted? Trying to see it's a good question. if any of these are rejected claims or just in a batch. It's a good question. These are all incurred. Incurred. So, all the claims are those that have been incurred for the, for the calendar year. Now, there's going to be some readjustment. I said that in the beginning. So, okay. you know, we don't know what that is. We were only given a certain set period of time. Okay. It's the best that we can give you. But it's really, it's not going to be, and you can ask some of the experts from the carriers, but it's <coughs> n I don't think it's going to be that much different. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chair. So when you look at Medicaid, you can still see the frequency of visiting the ED in a month. And this is the total Medicaid program. Okay, bef before you press on, we've got one more question, and then I think we're going to break for lunch. Is that Senator Elliott down there that's got her button pushed? Yes. You're yes. recognized. Um, if, if you're going to cover this later on, then you might, I'll, I'll just defer, but um, I've noticed at the end of the report where you have concerns listed, there is uh, a suggestion about uh, people not knowing how to, how to access the system and perhaps their navigators may be something we need to reconsider. How, what can you tell me about um, any conclusions you draw that people may be overusing the emergency room or whatever because they are new to healthcare system and don't know it's, how to access it? It's a great, great question. Um, the good news, we're going to cover this. At the, at the end, we have a slide on um, health disparities and 
some of the issues that we've seen in the communities. Since the last meeting, Senator Chesterfield brought up minority health issues. We wanted to make sure we get out to the field. Um, we've been in Pine Bluff, we were in Forest City, we were listening to a lot of the population of the, of the private option. Yeah. What was... Um, I'm sorry, but if you're going to cover it later, you don't have to do it for yeah, now. Yeah, I guess to I answer guess. real quick, because sometimes members will leave, and I want to make sure at least we address... <laughs> <Okay>. we, <laughs> you know us too well. <laughs> well That's why we're stopping for lunch here in just a minute. <laughs> it's probably going to take two minutes. Um, there was an interesting statement that was made by someone in the audience. It was in Representative Murdoch's area and Senator Ingram and, and Representative Ferguson. And he said that he contacted the primary care physician after the private option um, eligibility. And the primary care physician set up a meeting for him and it was about six months out. And he said to us, you know, I, I can't wait six months. So therefore I default to the emergency room to come see an emergency room doctor or physician because I have an issue here I want addressed. I think that's an issue, and it's also not knowing where where your PCP is in access. So th it definitely is an issue out there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, if it's all right, Ms. Steve, what we'll do is take a break for lunch because this is really oh. an important report, and there's a tremendous amount of data, and so we'll go let everyone get a chance to get filled and rested, and then we'll come back and start this at 1 o'clock. Thank you all. Do you have all those questions? Because I'm going to make sure we'll, like, some of those questions that I didn't like, so later we'll yeah, I can figure out. 